Hello dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Gagandeep Kaur, Assistant Professor, Khalsa College of Education, Ranjit Avenue, Amritsar. Today we will discuss the role of non-government organizations or NGOs and community-based organization or CBOs in school governance. After studying this module, you will be able to explain the meaning and concept of school governance, elucidate the meaning and concept of NGOs and CBOs, discuss the role of main stakeholders in school governance, describe the significance of NGOs and CBOs, give examples of major NGOs at international and national level, explain the role of NGOs in school governance, enumerate the structure of CBOs, discuss the role of CBOs in school governance. As we all know that the success of every school depends on the way it is managed. The efficient management of school depends mainly on the nature and the quality of the work carried out by the head who is the leader of a team of professional educators. He has to manage and supply the effective resources like human, financial and material resources. The head therefore needs to gain clear understanding of all the forces and factors which contribute towards the governance of the school. In present scenario, government specially focuses on the marginalized group of the society. So, the public-private partnership plays significant role in school governance and gives strengthening to our education system. Here we have to understand what is school governance. The word governance means the process of decision making. Governance can be used in several contexts such as school governance, corporate governance and local governance. But here we will deal only with the school governance. So what is school governance? School governance involves decision making on many things like deciding the goals, aims and objectives and decisions regarding the management strategies that is how things should be done that is the do's and don'ts decisions regarding the formulation of policies plans and budgets accountability and reporting mechanisms information sharing systems allocation and utilization and generation of resources it also deals with the determination and enforcement of rules procedures and guidelines stakeholder participation and community school relations, development of curriculum content and delivery approaches, managing the learning and teaching resources. Thus simply, we can say that it is the total management of school like the government manages the whole country. Now we will talk about the major characteristics of good school governance like how we can say that governance of this particular school is good or not? Here in this flowchart, you can see different characteristics of school governance. So first is participation. The participation by parents, teachers, community members and pupils is a key of good school governance. Second is rule of law. Good school governance require fair legal frameworks that are enforced impartially. It also requires promotion or protection of human rights. Third is transparency. Transparency means that the decisions taken, their enforcement are done in a manner that follows rules and regulations of the school. It also means that information is freely available and directly accessible to all. Fourth is responsiveness. Good school governance requires that school organs and processes should try to serve all the stakeholders, especially parents, teachers and pupils within reasonable time frame. Fifth is consensus oriented. Good school governance require mediation of the different interests in school to reach a broad consensus on what is in the best interest of the whole school community and how this can be achieved. Sixth characteristic of good school governance is equity and inclusiveness. 
that is ensuring that all members of the school community should feel that they have a stake in it and do not feel excluded from the mainstream. This inclusiveness is very much required especially by the marginalized groups for providing the opportunities to improve and for maintaining their well-being. The seventh one is effectiveness and efficiency. The concept of efficiency in the context of good school governance also covers the sustainable use of resources and the protection of the environment. The eighth one is accountability. That is an organization or an institution is accountable to those who will be affected by its decisions or actions. Well students, if you want to know the governance of any school, do check all these features of school governance. Next we will discuss the major participants and stakeholders who play an important role in school governance. What is stakeholder? So any person who has invested in the welfare and success of school including the administrators, teachers, staff members, students, parents, families, community members, local business leaders and elected officials such as school board members, city councillors and state representatives. In addition to this, the organizations that represent specific groups such as teacher unions, parent teacher organizations and other associations representing principals, school boards also be called as stakeholders. So basically we can say that stakeholders have a stake in the school means that they have personal, professional, civic or financial interest or concern. Thus, we will discuss these major participants in school governance and first of all is the headmaster. The headmaster is the key to well-managed school. A motivated, a highly committed head of the school does make a difference. Combination of a good headmaster and a team of good teachers is the ultimate formula of well-managed, sensitive and engaged school. Second stakeholders are parents. Parents' involvement includes acceptance of responsibilities and participation in school activities. This includes parent support by attending school functions and responding to school obligations, helping their children by encouraging and by monitoring homework. Playing roles in governance and making decisions on planning and development of the school and education. Third stakeholder we can say is community. So stronger links between the school and the community will give benefits to both of them. The joint community and school meetings can inspire a discussion on how they would like to see the school to be used to serve the local community. Next stakeholder is school managing committees. In journal, these committees have a role in school governance, in policy making, planning, budgetary allocations. They involve persons from local community members, education officers, head teachers, parents and local government representatives. Other stakeholder is parent teacher associations which can cooperatively organize some social events for parents and pupils by running clubs for extra curricular activities like sports, music activities. It also organizes meetings to inform parents about educational issues. Next participant is NGOs or non-governmental organization and community-based organization that is CBOs. These are the main stakeholders of the school governance and play an important role in quality management. Community-based organizations are non-profit groups that work at local level for improvement of its community. Their focus is to build equality across society in all streams like healthcare, environment, quality of education, access to technology, access to spaces and information for the disabled. Well students, we have discussed about the important stakeholders who work for maintaining the efficiency of school governance. Next, we will talk about the role of NGOs and CBOs in school governance. So, what is NGO? 
NGOs are the voluntary organizations which work without any profit making objective. These take active part in the cultural promotion, education, healthcare and other social problems. So the question is when and how the concept of NGOs came in our country. These NGOs proliferated in India during British rule in order to improve the social welfare and literacy. Numerous organizations were established during this period including the Friend in Need Society like in 1858, Prathna Samaj in 1864, Satya Shodhan Samaj in 1873, Arya Samaj in 1875, the National Council for Women in India in 1875 and the Indian National Conference in 1887. So students, the Central Social Welfare Board was established in 1953 to promote social welfare activities through these NGOs. This additional funding for social welfare developed the number of NGOs in the country. The establishment of the National Community Development Program and National Extension Service were early steps in this direction. Further, decentralization was achieved with the introduction of three-tier Panchayati Raj system in 1958. In 1958, the Association for Voluntary Agencies for Rural Development was founded as a consortium of major voluntary agencies. And ADB, Asian Development Bank, recognizes NGOs as significant player in the development process and cooperates with them to improve the impact, sustainability and quality of its services. So, what NGOs are basically doing? They are promoting sustainable development through innovation, that is identifying new approaches and models for specific activities for the community by accountability means ensuring that the project components are implemented as per plan then by responsiveness that is encouraging the implementation of projects to respond to local needs by participation ngos can serve as a bridge between the project authorities and affected communities through sustainability that is nurturing continuity in project work next we will discuss about the different types of NGOs. NGOs can be classified into various types based on different factors like orientation or level of cooperation. First, on the basis of orientation, NGOs can be grouped into charitable orientation, service orientation, participatory orientation and empowering orientation. Secondly, we can classify the NGOs by the level of cooperation. And these can be grouped into community-based organization, city-based organization, national NGOs and international NGOs. Here I would like to mention some of the important international NGOs working in the field of education like Education Without Borders, say Yes to Education, Canadian Human Rights Foundation, then is the Aga Khan Foundation, Open Society Institute, Agency for Development of Women and Children and Association of Farmers, Education and Traders, Youth for Understanding, etc. So, here it is very important to talk about our Indian NGOs who are playing crucial role in school governance. One of them is Pratham. It is India's largest NGO in the education sector in terms of the number of children assisted. Read India is its flagship program which aims to improve basic literacy and the mathematical abilities of underprivileged children. In 2011, Read India worked with nearly 2.4 million children and trained more than 60,000 teachers. Other is Azim Premji Foundation, established in 2001, works well with the state governments to reform teaching and testing methods in government schools. This foundation has also provided 20,000 schools across 16 states with syllabus-based multimedia kits that promote computer-assisted learning. Next is Akshya Patra. It is a large NGO with one goal that is to provide children with meals in the schools. 
The charity launched its first program in Bangalore in 2000 and it is providing lunch to 1.3 million children daily across the country. This initiative addresses two major issues that it boosts school attendance and tackles malnutrition. Akshay Patra works with eight state governments to implement its school lunch program. The another important project is Mukt Angan. This project draws women from low-income communities in Mumbai and trains them as English medium teachers. Since its founding in 2003, it has trained 180 teachers. Another very important initiative is Teach for India. One day, all children will attain an excellent education. This is the vision that defines Teach for India. Its Teach to Lead project encourages young college graduates to take up two years of full-time teaching sessions in under-resourced schools. Next is Make a Difference NGO. Along with its education partner, Cambridge University Press, this has initiated the English project to teach English to children from poor homes, orphanages and streets. Next is Barefoot College India. This organization was established in 1972. This gave training to local community people for teaching and other specialized professions. Another NGO is CRY, that is Child Rights and You. Or CRY is an NGO in India which is working for children and their rights. CRY has undertaken many initiatives to improve the condition of underprivileged children and one of them is Chote Kadam Pragati Ki Or, a literacy drive that has reached out to more than 35,000 children in 10 states of India. Mission Education is another very popular campaign from CRY to make sure that proper education should reach to every child. Next, we will talk about community-based organizations or CBOs and its role in school governance. Community-based organizations or CBOs are informal social networks which are a part of social capital and which can help to bring about the participatory development. Thus, accessing community resources through social capital in turn may help in the human capital development which is a crucial part of the inclusive growth. Since the future of the country depends upon its human capital, there is a need to focus on its qualitative development. In the words of Jongir et al, the CBOs are generally membership organizations consisting of group of individuals in a self-defined community who have joined together to further the common interests. They often consist of people living in close proximity to each other. The common interest includes production, consumption, pooled resources, or delivery of services. Thus, the organizations such as the women groups, credit saving groups, youth clubs, cooperative groups, religious groups, caste associations, and local NGOs can be called as community-based organizations. Next, we will talk about the major characteristics of community-based organization or CBOs. First of all, these groups are formed and managed by persons from community without any interference from government agencies. Secondly, these organizations work in close cooperation with the locals and work for local development. Other feature is their activities that satisfy the needs of rural communities through face-to-face -face interactions. They also promote the government-community partnership at the grassroots level. So basically, these community projects, for example, Uthan, can reach out to socially deprived children and connect them to the schools. However, the response of the school generally depends on the sensitivity of teachers and head towards these deprived children. Next, we will talk about the role of communities as these are providing infrastructures, the decentralized management, supervision of civil works and maintenance are very important activities of these school-based committees. In some states, they also help to identify and to recruit local teachers. The panchayat can mobilize 
and channel resources to the school like providing newspapers and books in Bihar and Gujarat and provide incentives like in Tamil Nadu ensure hygienic environment and giving midday meal supplement with fish eggs etc like in MP and Kerala in fact enrollment of children has improved because of their community mobilization efforts like by the special enrollment drives and focused programs for specific groups of children so we can clearly visualize that the enrollment and retention rates have improved across the country through these programs well students we have discussed about the role of NGOs and CBOs in school governance till now and next we will talk about some of the state policies and practices regarding CBO and its role in school governance. First is Nagaland Communitization of Public Institution and Services Act 2002. Its role is to monitor teacher attendance by no work, no pay rule or pay withhold salary and it monitors school level grants, managing school grants including teacher grants, financial and administrative monitoring and supervising the midday meals. Second is Kerala Panchayat Act 1999. Its role is to allocate more resources and Panchayat Education Committee monitors the performance of the schools. Third is Uthan program to address inclusion of Mahadalit which was started in Bihar and it provides interface between the families and the school, provides academic support and motivation to enroll, attend and to learn. Next is Nama Shalya, My School, a school community connect program started since 2007 in Karnataka. It gets support from Karnataka State Trainers Collective. It engages with the community of parents, panchayat, school and local NGOs to build ownership and to enhance quality. Also in Madhya Pradesh, Jan Siksha Adhiniyam was launched in 2002. It works for the inclusion of girls through Mahila Sikshan Abhiyan and Ma Beti Samelan. Next is activity based learning program in Tamil Nadu started since 2005. Its role is to enhance child-centered and activity-based multi-level learning in the classroom. To conclude, we can say CBOs are however constrained from providing more diverse range of services to their communities due to certain basic weaknesses, but these are working with proper networking with both local and external organizations. These grassroots level organizations support school governance in proper mode. In the end, we can say that community based organizations, CBOs and NGOs are small informal organizations that provides various services towards the development of rural communities and can be used as a channel to develop information and other resources required for proper school management. So students, I hope that now you are familiar with the concept and working of NGOs. Thanks for watching.